We'll start with Reuters, Jan. Yeah. Andrew Gray from Reuters. Uh, Secretary General, can you tell us how many uh, countries are currently meeting the 2% target according to your latest report? Um, and if that number is still relatively small as a part of the total, um, can you uh, comment on, do you have any concerns about the fact that even um, almost 10 years after that uh, goal was agreed, uh, most allies aren't make, meeting that target? We have all the numbers and the figures uh, updated in this uh, report, uh, both uh, graphically but also uh, in tables uh, where you can look into the details for each and every uh, ally. Um, and it shows that uh, seven allies now spend uh, 2%. Uh, uh, we actually expected that to be slightly more uh, earlier, uh, but because GDP has increased more than expected for a couple of allies, uh, two allies that we expected to be at 2% are now slightly below 2%. Um, um, so, as I said, uh, we welcome the progress. We welcome the fact that all allies have increased, that more allies uh, now spend uh, uh, 2% of uh, GDP on uh, defence, and more and more allies are actually coming closer to uh, 2%. Having said that, there's no doubt that we need to do more and we need to do it faster. The pace we have uh, when it comes to increased defence spending is not uh, high enough. Um, so uh, my message to allies is that I welcome what they have done, but they need to speed up, they need to deliver more. In a more dangerous world, we need to invest more uh, in uh, defense. Then let me add that, of course, it is important that uh, allies meet the 2% guideline. But of course, it also helps that those allies who have been close to 1% now are at 1.5 or moving towards 2%. So for instance, Germany uh, has significantly increased defense spending over the last years. They're still not at 2%. Uh, but the uh, increase in German defence spending re makes a big difference because of the sheer volume of the uh, German economy and the German defence budget, and Germany has clearly committed to uh, be at 2% uh, soon. Okay, we'll go to Associated Press. Uh, Secretary-General Lauren Cook from the Associated Press. You, um, you just met with the Hungarian foreign minister, uh, and I understand from some remarks that he's made in, in Brussels that you intend to go ahead with a, uh, a ministerial level um, meeting at some point, uh, NATO Ukraine. Uh, and I wondered why you've made that decision to go ahead, uh, despite what I understand to be existing Hungarian objections. Uh, and if I could briefly, I'd be very interested in any remarks you might have about the uh, Chinese peace plan. Uh, that uh, President Xi and, uh, and President Putin are talking about at the moment. Thank you. First, on uh, the peace plan. Um, uh, it is for Ukraine uh, to decide uh, what are acceptable uh, conditions uh, for any peaceful uh, solution. Uh, and uh, uh, China, therefore, needs to uh, start uh, to understand Ukraine's perspective uh, and to engage uh, with President uh, Zelensky uh, directly if uh, it's uh, serious, uh, if it wants to be serious about uh, peace. Uh, we also need to uh, remember that uh, China has not been able to condemn uh, the illegal war aggression by Russia against uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, having said that, of course I will welcome any initiative, any plan uh, that can lead to a just and uh, sustainable uh, peace. Um, China's peace proposal includes some positive uh, aspects and elements uh, which I uh, support. Uh, for instance, the uh, importance of nuclear uh, safety, of uh, protection of uh, civilians, and not least uh, uh, underlying the importance of uh, sovereignty, uh, territorial integrity and independence. Uh, and of course, any peace uh, solution for Ukraine must be based on these principles to the respect of the territorial integrity uh, and sovereignty of, uh, of Ukraine. And this is also the main element of uh, the peace plan that uh, President Zelensky put forward uh, some uh, months ago. Uh, and of course, any uh, and durable, uh, lasting peace has to respect Ukraine as a sovereign, independent nation in Europe uh, uh, in accordance with uh, the UN uh, Charter. Um, and a ceasefire or any solution that doesn't uh, respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine um, uh, will only be a way to freeze the war 
and uh, to ensure that uh, Russia can uh, reconstitute, uh, regroup, and re-attack. And that will not be a just and sustainable uh, peace. It will only help Russia to hold on to territory it has illegally uh, occupied. So again, I welcome initiatives that can lead to a just and sustainable peace. At the end of the day, it has to be uh, up to Ukraine to decide what are the acceptable conditions. What we should do is to support Ukraine in their right to defend themselves, a right which is enshrined in the UN Charter, and they are defending themselves against uh, Russia's uh, illegal war of, uh, of aggression. Uh, then uh, on, um, on the uh, NATO-Ukraine uh, uh, Commission, uh, yes, my plan is to convene uh, a meeting uh, um, at our foreign ministerial uh, meeting uh, in a couple of uh, weeks. Uh, I do so because I think this is a platform to uh, demonstrate our uh, uh, support to, uh, to uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is an enhanced opportunity partner. Um, but at the same time, I'm aware of the issues related to uh, minorities, and this is an issue that has also been discussed directly with uh, Ukraine in previous meeting, and I guess that will continue to be, I expect that to continue to be part of a dialogue with uh, Ukraine. Politico. Thank you very much. Secretary General, you mentioned that you will be advocating for a more ambitious defense investment pledge. I was wondering if you could share perhaps a bit of detail of what you would be advocating for at Vilnius. Would it be again a 10-year pledge? Uh, will the number still be 2% just as a floor or would you be advocating for a different number? Thank you. So first of all, it, it has to be, uh, or it will be up to uh, 30 allies, or so soon to be 32 allies, to decide what will be uh, the, uh, uh, the language of uh, a new uh, uh, defense investment uh, pledge. But I will work for, and I will advocate in favor of a more ambitious uh, pledge uh, than the pledge we made in, in 2014, uh, simply because, yes, the war started in 2014 with the illegal annexation of Crimea and Russia going into Eastern Donbas. But of course, the full-fledged invasion that we saw uh, last February has made a difficult and dangerous and, 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 and challenged security uh, situation even more dangerous and even more challenging. So if there was a need to increase defense spending back in 2014, it is even more obvious now. And, um, and, and of course, we also have to build on the progress we have made. Back in 2014, uh, 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 the majority of NATO allies were reducing their uh, defense budgets. Uh, total defense spending across Europe and Canada was going down year by year. So we were on a downward trend, uh, and only three allies uh, spent 2% or more uh, on, on defense. Since 2014, that picture has totally changed. Now all allies have uh, uh, increased defense spending, um, and, uh, and, uh, and in totality, uh, we now have eight consecutive years of uh, uh, more defense spending across Europe and Canada. So uh, we are in a totally different place. Uh, than where we were in 2014 when things were going down, now they're going up and, and, and they're going significantly up defense spending. So of course when you then agree a new defense investment pledge at the uh, summit in Vilnius, it has to build on the progress we've already made and take into account the fact that we live in a more dangerous uh, world. Um, so what I will argue in favor is that uh, when we refer to 2% in the pledge we made in Wales at the NATO summit in Wales in 2014, we refer to that as something we should strive towards, more like a, a, a kind of a, a ceiling. Uh, uh, but now we should refer to 2% more as a floor, a minimum. Uh, and of course, then we had a kind of 10-year perspective, um, uh, 2014 to 2024. Now I think we should be uh, all understand that this is going to immediate need uh, to be there, and we have had now 10 years already to move towards 2%. So I expect uh, actually the reality that uh, the majority of allies could be able to be at 2% very quickly. Agence France Press, here. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary General. Um, just returning to uh, the issue of China, um, have you had, do you have any more information on whether China is planning or is actually supplying arms to Russia for the war in Ukraine? And more specifically, what is your message to President Xi as he meets with a leader who is now accused of committing war crimes? Thank you. So first, 
Uh, we haven't seen any proof that uh, China is uh, delivering lethal uh, weapons to Russia. Uh, but we have uh, seen uh, some signs that uh, this has been a request uh, from Russia and that this is an issue that uh, is, con is, is uh, considered uh, 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 in Beijing or by the Chinese authorities. And therefore our message has been that China should not provide lethal aid to, uh, to, uh, to Russia. Uh, that will be uh, to support uh, an illegal war uh, and only prolong the war and support uh, the a legal invasion uh, of, uh, of Ukraine by, by Russia. That's something that China, of course, not should do. Um, um, then, uh, of course, the meeting um, that takes place in Moscow is part of a pattern we have seen uh, over the last years, where China and Russia are coming closer and closer. Uh, we have to remember that just uh, a couple of weeks, a few weeks before the invasion last February, President Xi and President Putin met in Beijing, uh, where they signed a joint declaration promising each other uh, a partnership without any limits. Um, and, uh, and we see how China and Russia are uh, coming closer and closer in the military domain. They have uh, joint exercises, joint patrols, naval and air patrols uh, in the economic domain and also in the political and diplomatic uh, domain. So the meeting in Moscow is part of that pattern where China and Russia are working more and more uh, closely and building a stronger and stronger uh, partnership. Uh, Slovenian TV over there, yeah. Uh, Igor Juric, uh, Slovenia, over there. Slovenian Television uh, Secretary uh, General, just a short uh, question. Uh, how do you see and, of course, also comment uh, the latest development in the relations between uh, Serbia and uh, Kosovo, especially after this uh, Ohrid uh, meeting of uh, both leaders? Well, uh, also I welcome the agreement. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, important thing now is uh, the full implementation, the speedy and full Im implementation of the agreement between uh, Belgrade and, uh, and Pristina. Um, and of course, we strongly support uh, the EU-facilitated dialogue. Uh, we, uh, NATO allies and NATO provide political support. We have been in close contact uh, uh, with uh, uh, the EU, but also with uh, Pristina and Belgrade. Uh, and of course, we support also uh, uh, the efforts uh, to find a peaceful uh, solution uh, through our K4 mission, uh, uh, close to 4,000 NATO troops uh, in, uh, in Kosovo, uh, which are key to, uh, to, uh, to facilitate and, and, uh, and support a political uh, process. Um, so we welcome the agreement. Uh, the message is that it has to be fully and, uh, and, and quickly uh, implemented by both parties. Frankfurt Allgemeine. Not to Thomas Kuschka, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, two questions. The first is for clarification. Um, has Hungary formally agreed to another meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Commission? And the second one is on ammunition. Yesterday, EU foreign and defense ministers took the decision to provide Ukraine with one million artillery shells within 12 months. Um, uh, Commissioner Breton is also um, working with industry uh, to get around bottlenecks in the production, hoping to speed it up. I'm just wondering, what specifically is NATO's role in speeding up delivery and production of artillery shells? What specifically can NATO do? Thank you. Uh, uh, first, on the on the on the on the speeding up uh, delivery, as we NATO has many tasks. So first of all, uh, it's for us to set the guidelines, and uh, we started uh, last year to revise our guidelines, and not least for battle decisive ammunition, which includes artillery shells, uh, to ensure that uh, allies started uh, uh, to ramp up production both to replenish uh, the stockpiles, which they have depleted to provide support to Ukraine, but of course also to be able to continue to, uh, to uh, deliver uh, support to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we met with the defense industry, we met with our armored directors, uh, and, uh, and the message was very clear, ramp up production, and I welcome that all of these several allies have signed contracts. Uh, of course, that is... Uh, a national uh, decision to sign the concrete contracts with the industry. 
uh, but we also do uh, and have done for many years, including on ammunition, uh, we, have, uh, we are doing joint procurement, uh, uh, partly uh, with groups of NATO allies, uh, but also through the uh, NATO support and procurement agency. So joint procurement is something we have done for many years. We will continue to do joint procurement, uh, including of ammunition. Um, for instance, the NSPA now is working on both uh, or have projects both on uh, artillery, uh, uh, but also uh, uh, air defense uh, 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 ammunition and other types of ammunition. So I welcome, of course, also the fact that uh, EU is now also engaging in joint procurement. Uh, but the most important thing is not whether the joint procurement is a group of nations or EU or the NATO uh, procurement agency, uh, or whether it's done by individual allies. The most important thing is that contracts are signed uh, with the industry, so production can be increased. And we have already seen uh, more uh, contracts being signed, and we welcome all the different initiatives in different formats uh, for joint procurement, uh, because we think that can uh, help to speed up and also uh, utilize the economy of, uh, of scale. Uh, but again, it happens in different formats, including uh, 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 through the uh, NATO Support and Procurement uh, uh, Agency. Um, um, so far, NATO allies have have uh, delivered uh, uh, military support of uh, 65 billion uh, 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 euros. Uh, 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 a lot of that comes from the United States, but also Canada and European allies are providing significant military support to uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, and this is not least uh, uh, to finance uh, the delivery of uh, of uh, ammunition. Um, um, yeah, then, sorry? Yeah, they, yeah so, well, it, it's my prerogative to uh, convene the, uh, the NATO Ukraine uh, Council. Uh, um, uh, uh, no, yeah, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I do that because I think the time has come. Uh, um, of course, I always try to have uh, allies to agree, but uh, when we cannot fully agree, then it's still my prerogative to uh, convene in meetings of the North Atlantic Council in different formats, and, and now I do that.